So uh, I was thinking, I was thinking, you know, what would be the best way to run this is maybe uh, as him since uh, since you're uh, you're the one who's most uh, well versed and uh, somewhat opinionated on the matter. Maybe you can tell our audience a little bit about what uh, what is this whole thing about? What are we even talking about here? You probably already know there are 14, 8,000 meter peaks uh, around the world and they're mostly between Nepal and Pakistan. Um, and then, of course, they've all been climbed now, but um, the first person to ever climb them without using supplementary oxygen was Ronald Messner. And, you know, he's regarded in the mountaineering world as the father of alpinism and mountaineering and, you know, mountaineering as we know it today, of course. Um, and he was very, very uh, purist. So no external support, depend completely on your own abilities to, to climb the mountain. And um, he's definitely not an easy character as far as we know about him. But, you know, this is the case with uh, anyone who's done great things. You're, you're doing great things right now with your phone. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he was, he, you know, he's regarded as the first person to have climbed them without supplementary oxygen. And I remember when he first attempted Everest without using a uh, bottle of oxygen, um, everyone was telling him you're going to die like it hasn't been done before no one's gone to this altitude without oxygen and has any chance of survival his own personal doctor was begging him not to go and um, he didn't listen to any of them he went anyway and he made it and it was at the time the greatest feat of you know high altitude mountaineering ever done it was unthinkable uh, and he continued on with this um, often losing partners along the way uh on his climbs but it, it never stopped him because because this was extremely personal to him D didn't he lose his own his own brother as well on his own climb? brother yeah on nanga parbat uh, uh, he lost his but it was his first time on an eight thousand meter peak and you think that would kind of deter you away from <laughs> from this but he just kept going and um yeah, I mean, this this was all fueled by uh, his personal reason of wanting to break his own limit or break the limit of what is possible or push the limits of the sport uh, or whatever it is to him. And um, yeah, extremely admirable, of course. He's a lot of people's heroes. Anyway, fast forward to a couple of months ago. Wait, so 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 has it just just so that every just to create the context. So this what we're talking here. This is like the 1980s, basically 1970 to 1980s, when uh, when when you know these these kind of the, the giants of mountaineering, if you like, were were kind of doing all the firsts of everything. So a lot of these summits hadn't even been reached before, or hardly been reached before, with oxygen and the you know the whole shebang. And here comes Reinhold Messner. Uh, breaking these these boundaries and, and and making it possible to for other people to actually climb without oxygen because he'd proven that you don't just you don't you basically you can do it it's possible not to die essentially exactly exactly and over and above that actually he was usually climbing from a completely new route in alpine style which means it's a route that no one's done before no one knows anything about it. Pure adventure, you know, the unknown. This is, I think, what it's about. Um, yeah, completely new route uh, and alpine style, which means, you know, that in the 50s and 60s, it was ex expeditions where like an army, you lay siege to a mountain and you conquer it and you go up setting camps and then you come back down and you get more supplies and more food. And this takes like hundreds of people's worth of effort. Um, but he was going either alone or with a partner and they would just, the minute they reach base camp, they head up, they don't come back down until they're on the summit. So of course it's, I guess, dangerous in a way. Um, but this is the price that you pay for going on an amazing adventure. 
um, something that you know very few people will get to experience. And something super interesting, he was the first to link uh, the Gashar Brahms in Pakistan, which are two also 8,000 meter peaks. And um, up until then, people were doing Gashar Brahm one, then they come down and then the next season, the next year, they go up and they try and do Gashar Brahm two. Um, but he did this insane link up between both of them. And he talked about how this is probably one of his hardest climbs like the, the hardest he's ever had to you know go on a, on a climb um so yeah this was in the 70s and 80s uh since then he's also he's crossed the sahara desert he's uh he's been to both poles he's done a lot of things that people don't really know that he's done um he's just known for this 14 8000 meter peak record because now it's become a challenge the 14 8000 meter peaks and it's the dream of many different mountaineers whether uh, you know mountaineers going on uh, expeditions prepared organized by themselves or buying into commercial expeditions all right so so, so what's so what what's been what's been happening since like like now fast forward so uh, where what like Ryan Messner has this record we know that um, and he's a, and he's a, and he's a great, like one of the, one of the climbing greats. Here we are now, it's 2023. Why are we still talking about Reinhold Messner? Why is he even a subject right now? Yeah. So he hasn't been doing anything for the last decade or so, but then a few months ago, um, there's a website called 8,000ers and they kind of keep track of everyone who's ever climbed an 8,000 meter peak. Um, and there's this one guy who has been doing research for the last 20 years with a team that no one else was willing to do. Um, and he was basically looking into everyone's account uh, who has been to an 8,000 meter peak. And he defined a successful climb on an 8,000 meter peak as one that reaches the true summit of a mountain. So not five meters below the summit, not 20 meters below the summit, the, the summit is the summit where you can't go any higher. Uh, and after his research, which, re, which was based on pictures, GPS locations, all of that, um, he concluded, him and his team concluded that um, Reinhold Messner did not reach the true summit of Annapurna. He was actually five meters below the actual summit, but he was, uh, I think 20 kilometers away from it horizontally, but just five meters in altitude. Um, so uh, they took his name off the, the records on the website. And soon enough, the Guinness World Book of Records also took his name uh, as the first to do the 14, 8,000 meter peaks. And now officially the first to have done them is Ed Vistras, uh, an American climber. And this kind of started this whole debate of can you consider that he has actually done it? Has he actually done it or not? And is it even worth talking about? I mean, for so so, so from I mean, if you were to take like a, a, just the a, a layman's perspective, I suppose on this, and you're saying that the summit is at this altitude at this point on the map, and you didn't reach this point on the map then did you then you you i i suppose from a purist point of view uh you haven't made the summit right where 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 is where do you where to your mind i mean maybe maybe we can uh get gino in on this as well like what where, where it to your mind is the the pushback. Where's the controversy here? Apart from that, you know, he's a he's a climbing great who, you know, maybe didn't achieve or wasn't aware that he didn't achieve even because in those days you didn't have the kind of altimeters and 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 gadgets and widgets that we have today. Maybe with a five meter difference, I've been on the tops of some of these places. You can't you you can't really know, you know, what what point along a ridge is actually the highest. Where 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 is the controversy here? 
I think it's a, it's a big debate here because, because of all of his accomplishments and because of his reputation um, in the mountaineering world as a purist, as this guy who's opened the gates for everybody to follow his footsteps, you know, um, when, when you're the first to do something, when you do a first ascent or the first to do a certain challenge, um, that basically, that climb is the hardest climb on that specific route um, before everybody else does it after. Because once you know that it's possible, that really makes it much easier. But once you're the first one there, you still have that uncertainty. And so because he opened that door to everyone else, I think that's why it's a controversial move because everybody regards him as the person who's opened the door, who's, who's traced the footsteps um, for everyone else. And, uh, and I think people are kind of reluctant to taking that record away from him. Um, and just, just to ask, like, he's only climbed Annapurna once. Do you know? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, actually. Um, but most likely, yeah. Most likely, yeah. Yeah, if they're basing it on that one record, then most likely, yeah. Look, I mean, it's it, it makes it, it makes it makes perfect. Like, like, yeah. So, so I mean, I I, I get it. Like, there is a there is a there's a sentimental value attached to Reinhold Messner and what it was that he has achieved, and I can completely. I guess from, from that perspective, I completely understand. And if we were taking it empirically, um, and I, it's interesting, Hazem, that you pointed out that this person who, um, has done this study is not, um, himself, uh, uh, a mountaineer, right? So this is entirely done through, through, uh, kind of a, a data gathering, um, that has no, uh, that has no emotional investment or or physical investment in actually being there and understanding what this environment is. So it's completely devoid of the emotional element of being there and doing this. And kind of what Gino's alluding to the you know this this whole idea that this guy is a pioneer for all of us. He he cut steps into the roof of the world so that we can go beyond that. If uh, you know and and discover new possibilities that we thought were previously the roofs of the world as well. So, um, so from that perspective, definitely it makes, it makes a lot of sense that there's this, there's this pushback. Um, but then, yeah, it comes this, I think this opens up an entirely different conversation where it's like, are we, are, are we as mountaineers for, forget the, you know, everything else from it. Are, are we as mountaineers is our success or failure measured entirely by whether or not a step was made slightly to the left or slightly to the right based on our, you know, uh, smart watches that are sending back this data. Is that what, what climbing is, or is it the overall achievement of being there, of, of being that pioneer? And then if we were to go back to the other side of this and say, no, it's actually, it is, you do have to be at that moment in time, at that top, at that point, at that, at that whatever, and take this um, empirically purist perspective, then where do you draw the line on this? Because there's also there there there'll, there'll be a, there's another school of thought that would say, well, let we have to also take the starting point. You know, the starting point was at as here was was at this point and not maybe below it. You know, if you want to be purely a purist when it comes to the empirical evidence, technically summiting a mountain starts from the seaside, right? Which I highly I don't think anybody actually has ever done. So. I get the I get the I get the um, the pushback on both sides, and I understand that there are limitations to both. But where do we how like to to take this kind of drastic step and say we're you know speaking on behalf of mountaineering, um, we are going to remove this guy's record who is basically who's who's done so much for this for this community and enabled so much for us to achieve uh, based on circumstance like on 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 empirical evidence that doesn't factor in what it means what goes into actually being on the summit i think that is fair enough but it's not a reflection of the sport in its entirety 
that makes any sense. I don't know. I think I went off on a crazy tangent there. It's it's interesting to see actually uh, Messner's response to to all of this and to his records uh, being stripped and whatnot. Um, and he uh, specifically speaks to the person who runs the website, 8000ers.com, uh, Jurgalski. Um, and he tells, him, he tells him that he's clueless uh, and he's pointing to alpinism's inherent subjectivity. Um, he also says that there are no records in traditional alpinism um, and that he is still the conqueror of the use useless but he's gained so much in his life that he can probably say that he's a happy man. So in the end, he acknowledges that climbing mountains is a selfish activity. It doesn't really do anything for the world. Um, and it's, it is just like an inherently subjective sport also. Like you said, you get to a mountain, uh, to the summit, and you, you don't really know where the true summit is, it's like really hard to tell, especially back then. Um, and now that we have all these tools and still to this day, um, people are, uh, are debating the true height of these mountains. Right. So basically he, he's, he's not really phased by, by his record, uh, being taken, taken away. Um, and that in, he believes that in traditional alpinism, their, their records don't really mean anything. Um, I don't know what you guys think about that statement. I, I mean, this, of course I have, I, I do not see the usefulness of having a record at all. I do see the usefulness of people opening up um, ways and paths for people to follow in and then push beyond. And I think this is the point for me when I hear of a record. Um, it's that someone broke a boundary. And now we know that we can push this boundary even further. And it's always interesting to see how the sport or the activity evolves after a boundary has been broken. Because you think you know, this is it. No one is going to top this. And then a month later, some kid from I don't know where, he like doubles that or, you know, whatever. And then your your mind is blown and it inspires you to push yourself harder based on your own limits. But um, the, the issue, the issue, like the, the bigger debate here for me was um, like, like what this put into the spotlight was, uh, you know, the, the, the records that exist today that is now suddenly, it's, it's now suddenly very profitable to have a record. And commercial outfitters are using this to attract more people because now a record is, it's, it's sexy. You know, if you come, if you do, uh, Everest and Lotsi in under three hours, you would be the first, uh, Egyptian to have done it in under two hours. But what kind of record is that? You have your, your, your name, your name gets written into a book in like size four font in italics. And then that's, that's, uh, that's what you get. Exactly. Exactly. So it, it kind of, uh, I have to ask the question, uh, what, what is the point here? And I mean, everyone climbs for their own reason. I get it. And I have no problem with someone who wants to climb for fun or who wants to break the boundaries of the sport or who wants to do it to impress his girlfriend back home. That's, they're all viable reasons to go climbing. Um, but then once you make it public, you put yourself up for scrutiny and you put yourself up, you're, you're allowing yourself to be, um, I don't know if judged is the right word, but the minute you go public with a record like I was the youngest Egyptian to climb Kilimanjaro, I'm going to start question. I don't know about other people, but for me, I'm going to start questioning. I I'll be very direct and I'll say, yes, but what does that do? Like, wh where's the achievement in that? I think there are definitely achievements and then there are records. And to mix the two or to conflict the two, it does more harm to the maybe not to the sport i don't know because at the end it's all forgotten but i guess it does more harm to other mountaineers uh, in general or 
um, you know, where, where, where the spotlight should be. So people are not maybe in 50 years, they're not going to remember Reynold Messner, maybe, who knows, but they might remember someone, you know, with the loudest voice and the most followers on Instagram and the most like uh, written records in places where they were the youngest to climb the 14, 8,000 meter peaks. And they're not going to remember that the reason this person was able to climb, to be the youngest to climb the 14,000 peaks, uh, the 14, 8,000 meter peaks, is because of people like Reynold Messner. Look, uh, Hazem, you, <clears throat> I want to, I want to, like, m- maybe take it a, a step further, I, I think. And because it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing that you said there that um, you, there's, you know, there are achievements and there are records. Uh, and everybody has their own reasons for coming to the mountain and for doing their thing. Um, and who are we to say whether there, there is no right reason or, or a wrong reason? Um, but there is, it is interesting that reasons develop over time. And sometimes if we were, if there was maybe the initial contact with something, maybe for the wrong reasons, or maybe, or, or whatever, or the reasons that maybe are not necessarily ones that we would agree with now that we've matured somewhat in the sport, um, have, if you like, uh, uh, without that reason, it wouldn't ha- you wouldn't have touched the sport and it wouldn't have then opened itself up to you and you to it in a way that has actually created this entirely new perspective and this entirely new interaction with it. I mean, I speak from myself, like I, I came to this, uh, to, 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 to mountains, uh, from, uh, from uh, skiing competitions. Uh, and, uh, and, and it was all about a uh, giant slalom. We've got to, we've got to win, got to go fast, got to go faster, got to go faster. Um, and then, and that, that was in my younger days. And then as an adult, it was, it was kind of, it was a, it was a, a way for me to express to my social circle that, Hey, you know, I've moved on and I'm, I'm back to where I was in the mountains and I want everybody to know about it. But then whilst doing that, while being there, I discovered what I, this appreciation for this, that completely makes me cringe when I think about my initial motivations and makes me cringe about when I, when I think about some of the things I may have said in my earlier days. And, but today I, I go like, Without that, without this attractiveness, this surface level attractiveness of the record, because that's what it is. It's a surface level attraction. It's the first, it's the first layer, if you like, of, of, of interaction is like the record. Once you peel that layer off or you start to dive into it or whatever analogy you want to use here, you start to discover what what this thing is and what it does for you and but for that initial layer but for that first level of of attraction it would never have happened and so maybe in that sense these records somehow do matter and that maybe this 16 year old kid uh, to use your example you know egyptian kid who wants to be the youngest to go up kilimanjaro or whatever you know maybe that experience that that or that surface level want enables them to actually take that step to go to Kilimanjaro and then in so doing have that moment when they are close to the summit and they look at the horizon and they see that sunrise over the roof of Africa and their their entire I don't even know how to describe it but anybody who's been to these places would understand what I'm saying it's like you have this opening up of yourself to this incredible energy in this incredible space. And that transforms you for the rest of your life. And now you're, yeah, maybe the youngest Egyptian to have gone to Kilimanjaro, but you're also probably one of the, you know, the, the wisers, the wiser for it as a result of that experience that will, that will then drive you in a, to, towards a different path or a different understanding of life that, you wouldn't have reached but for that initial 
motivation. What, what, what do you think about that? I went like, again, I'm going, I'm doing one of these things where <laughs> I like, I go off. I, you know, there's a takeoff and I start to fly somewhere in the sky and then I'm like, Oh crap, I got to land this thing. I'm out of fuel and, uh, and uh, midway through a sentence. And then I'm like, okay, where am I going to land? And I try to find a landing spot. So yeah, that's, that's what I got. That's all I have fuel for right now. <laughs> That's cool. That's, that's like, uh, it's like Michael Scott from the office when he said, uh, sometimes I start a sentence, but I have no idea where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> you make a good point with the, with the whole, uh, like you, you kind of in the be beginning, you do it to stroke your own ego and, and to try to, you know, think you're doing something greater by, by, by breaking a record or, or having your own record. Um, but I don't think it's the case for everyone. I think maybe as people get older, they, they start seeing it the way you see it, where you kind of do it for the experience uh, and for the, the healing properties that it does to you and the, how it grounds you, how it connects you to this planet. Um, but I don't think that's the case for everyone. I think people still, especially in today's world where we're a very image conscious society um, and we're all from a very image conscious culture. Uh, these, these things maybe don't uh, like they, they, they still turn into ego stroking um, uh, things that you do instead of like this internal uh, uh, like uh, life changing experience. Yeah, that's a, uh... Yeah, I kind of, I have to agree with you there that it's maybe not like that for everyone. I mean, it was like that for you, um, maybe because you were lucky to have um, mentors who helped you get there. Or maybe you did it on your own, but there were other factors that allowed you to get there. Uh, for me as well, um, when I first started, my mentor was... Uh, 50 year old guy from uh, from France and he was very old school and he went hard on me he wasn't easy at all and I was doing this for fun I wanted to take cool pictures and come back home and show my friends and be like you know look where I was I was at the top of a cliff can you imagine and then I would look super cool but uh, yeah he wouldn't allow me to to even take my phone up there he's like no pictures <laughs> And uh, I kind of, like, I see that, of course, back then I hated it for, like, I hated him for it. But now I, I see the, I see the merit of it. So I was lucky to have this, you know, person in my life who helped me get through the surface level of what climbing is and to begin my own journey and my own path with it. Uh, but not everyone is so lucky, especially like Gino said, in today's world. Um, that, that I see now that a lot of people are, like all these new records that are coming up, like the, you know, the, the fastest Everest, let's say link up, um, but they were on a commercial expedition. And I mean, we can all agree that maybe you disagree, but I think mountaineering is actually 10% actual climbing and it's 90% melting snow for water, preparing your food, pitching up your tent, figuring out where you're going to pitch your tent and, you know, organizing logistics and, making sure you have all your gear and buying the right gear and fixing your gear when it breaks and making sure you're ready for a storm and being prepared that if shit happens up there, you can bring yourself back down using your own, you know, skill and will and perseverance and all of that. And this is 90% of what mountaineering is about. So for someone that buys into an expedition and they just train very physically hard for it, and I'm not saying it's not an easy thing. Of course, it's a difficult thing. Uh, and we see, like, we personally see how people suffer on these uh, climbs. It's not easy for them. And, but then, and this is totally, you know, this is good for them. But then they come back and they capitalize on people's ignorance of the sport or of the activity and what it is. And suddenly they have the loudest voices and they have the biggest platforms. And then it's a misrepresentation of the sport. And the more recognition they get for it, you know, the more they want to do it because it feels good. Recognition feels amazing. It's, it's addictive. It's a drug. You're not going to get enough of it. You're not going to suddenly wake up and be like, 
you know, I was an idiot. This is, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Unless there is an external force outside that tells you you're an idiot. And I take it upon myself to be that voice. <laughs> All right. The, 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 great, the, 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 great, the great sage has him. Thank you. <clears throat> for for always being there to tell us what idiots we all are, um, but listen, I think I think you I think you I think you tied it I think you tied in really nicely because you know then that so it comes so 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 it comes back to this question of does does it even matter that this that you know Reinhold Messner's uh, uh, record is taken away by people who don't have a clue about mountaineering. Uh, have never been there, will never be there. Don't understand the, all the other factors that, that 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 come into this. Don't understand the impact that the achievement had on the culture, and are purely fixated on one very particular nuance. In the same way that you just described, people being fixated with just the singular physical challenge of climbing when on a commercial expedition, as opposed to everything else that is involved with it. If we fixate on this singular five meter difference between where Reinhold Massner may or may not have stood, that in and of itself, from a mountaineer's perspective, from a holistic understanding of this sport, this culture, and this incredible thing, this movement that this that that achievement inspired after that, then of course, I think there's no other way to conclude but that. Uh, that the you know you can take strip away all the Guinness books of world records you know uh, all these empirical studies about whether or not he was five meters higher or lower or not on the summit is quite irrelevant. We're talking about uh, the minutia of minutia and the grand scheme of what this what that achievement had inspired and in having a, a more holistic understanding of mountaineering. Uh, would inevitably lead you to the conclusion that that is absolutely a first in its own right, and that we, and the proof of that is where mountaineering went from that point onwards. It was a ceiling that was destroyed because the human mind perceived that it would perceived his achievement at that time, even where he stood, to have been impossible. And that ceiling was 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 torn to shreds, and a new ceiling was created. It was pushed way way higher than that. And if we are mountaineers to dig steps as far as we can go for the people behind us to go further than us, he absolutely did that, and he holds that record. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, he he also mentions it. He he doesn't really it doesn't affect him. It doesn't matter to him that he doesn't have the record because he's for him he still made it up that mountain without oxygen. Um, now, if a third party body doesn't recognize that, that he doesn't care. And even the, the, the guy, the American climber, Ed Vesters, who holds the record now, also, I believe, mentioned that he still views Reinhold Messner as the person who, who made it possible for everyone else, including himself, to, to, to follow in his footsteps. So, yeah. Right. So, so, so maybe, maybe to, to, to wrap this up, let's, uh, let's, uh, cause I'd love to go into efficacies of commercial expeditions and, and all that, you know, and all the, the record breaking stuff. But I think that's a, that's a topic for another, for another, uh, for another panel. Uh, but, uh, Hazem, uh, yay or nay, does in your, to your mind, Reinhold Messner, is he the undisputed first person to summit all 14, 8,000 meter mountains without oxygen? Definitely, yeah. absolutely. And uh, Gino, your thoughts? Technically, no, but spiritually, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can't argue. Yeah, yeah. You can't argue with science in the end, but like, but that's it's it's such a subjective thing in the end that it's well, yeah. He's he's made it. Well, look, I have. A, I, I let, let me let me put it one, in one other way before we wrap up. So, a few months ago, we were on the Mont Blanc, and uh, we had a we had a team there, Life Happens Outdoors team. We were on the summit ridge, and uh, and the the wind was insane. Basically, the weather forecast was completely off. Uh, every single because all the expeditions went, all the teams went for it. Because normally, when the weather is a little bit off, you'll find that. 
a big number of people wouldn't have gone. Every team tried because the weather window appeared to be very clear, but then it was total shambles. Uh, we were expecting the bad weather to start at like 4 p.m. It started at like 9 a.m. So, uh, so we were caught out on the, on the summit ridge uh, with, with crazy, crazy, crazy weather. And the last stretch between the, we're talking about a matter of meters, nothing like less, maybe even less than the five meters that are, that are being discussed vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Reinhold Messner's record on Annapurna. And it was just a matter of traversing this completely exposed ridge to get those extra three meters or however many meters it was to get the eight, you know, 4,810. Was, which, by the way, changes because it depends on the on the health of the glacier that year. We could have been higher than last year's summit where we stood, because um, you know these things move, and and we decided that we are this is this is fantastic, but we it's not safe to peer over the ridge, but we are on the top, and 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 I believe that I believe that we are on the top because we are we are there. We're we're talking about. Uh, uh, such a small space to move around and there are other factors involved here that make it whether or not we're going to push a little bit further on. as far as I'm concerned it's not even a thought in my mind that we summited that day that team summited the Mont Blanc under horrendous conditions um, and then we came back but I also accept that there's another side to this conversation um, in which people are going to come with a measuring tape and <laughs> You know, and and do a little and do a little, you know, uh, 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 empirical research, and then determine from the comforts of the warm house that they live in, and the and the and completely uh, uh, remove from the circumstances of and the nuances of that specific climb, um, and 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 pass judgment. So I guess in that sense, Gino, you're right, but I also think here Asim has a has a has a an extremely valid point. My perspective, I think, on this is that it's it's. Uh, I think these the number like the, I'm not a measuring tape type of person. I was never I was never interested in, in anything like that. And I think that ultimately it's about uh, it's about the achievement, and the achievement is more than whether or not you are accurate to a specific number uh, to the dot based on instruments that are brought in 40, 50 years after the fact that com completely disregard the circumstances of the moment, let alone the circumstances of the time. So there we have it. Um, yeah. Anybody, anybody want to say anything else before we wrap this one up? I'm good. Thanks for having us. Ah, my pleasure. Yes. Thank you for bringing in the perspectives. <laughs> Back to work.